Hello and welcome to this CNBC Africa special. My name is Michael Magisha. On this edition, we highlight some of the key conversations we've had in 2018. Now, over the next hour, we'll be looking at the recently signed partnership between Alibaba and Rwanda Development Board, Rwanda's growing agriculture sector, to the country's economic development at 24 years after the genocide. Now, stay tuned for all and more. Hello and welcome to Doing Business in Rwanda. My name is Michael Mjisha. On this particular episode, we speak to different stakeholders in regards to the newly signed partnership between Rwanda and Alibaba Group, of course, the Electronic World Trade Platform, the very first of its kind on this continent. Now, this is expected to help Rwandans trade directly with the Chinese and, of course, instill more on the trading skills in the country. Now, we speak to them to find out how this is going to boost a trade between the two countries on this episode of Doing Business in Rwanda. It is my, my great honor and also it is Alibaba's great honor to be able to partner with Rwanda. And today it is a very, very important day. To me, internally, I think it's a historical day. And thank you so much for within such a short time, Clara, you and your team, to make this thing happen. We never thought it could be happening in that quick. You have gone through a lot of things because we are spending time, efforts, for the future of Rwanda and future of Africa. And I hope from today, the EWTP Rwanda can be able to support small business, young people, women here in Africa, and sell their things to enable them to global buy, global sell, global deliver, global pay, and global travel. Rwandan producers will be able to sell directly uh, to a much larger set of customers than before while bypassing costly intermediaries. This improves productivity and profitability as well. Put differently, there are really no downsides to doing business on a global scale. I want to challenge Rwandan companies and uh, young people, men and women, to take full advantage of this technology and not lose sight of fundamentals. Well, the partnership that uh, we have with Alibaba has four elements. The first one is trade, really promoting trade through e-commerce. And uh, for that, we started with coffee. We sent out um, 1,800 packs of coffee as a trial. And one of the brands was sold the same day that it was put on the market, while one, another brand got a very good review by consumers online. The second part uh, of our partnership is tourism, where we're going to put 200 products on the tourism platform of Alibaba. It's called Fliggy. It's very important for us to be on the Chinese market because China has the you know, highest spending tourists or travelers in the world. A Chinese tourist spends twice as much as an American and four times as much as a, a, China, a German traveler. The third component is training. We know that to become very good at e-commerce, we need people that understand e-commerce. Because if we're going to sell, it involves a lot of components. It involves managing logistics, it manages online, it manages, it means um, talking to consumers and negotiations online. There's a lot of supply chain logistics that is done online and that is knowledge that is needed. The fact that the platform will enable Rwandan products to be sold directly to China is the most interesting news to local businesses. It presents an invaluable opportunity to access a bigger and perhaps more profitable market. It offers us a huge opportunity. One of the challenges that has always plagued at least our export market uh, in Rwanda is that at least in relation to China and selling to that market, which is a very massive market, um, has always been access. 
you know, the Chinese consumer um, predominantly is served in Mandarin. We have very few mechanisms within our economy to be able to tap into that. Um, there are certain aspects in relation to the sophistication, sophisticated nature of some of these supply chains with other countries we're competing with. So, for example, when you when you talk about coffee, South America has a much more robust um, logistics system, supply chain um, strategy that enables it to compete better than, than, for example, Rwanda, Uganda, Kenya, Burundi, Ethiopia, when it comes to selling coffee in China. I think it brings... Uh market it brings more demand if people here were making uh, their product on uh, such demand it is another demand coming up so which is good for us if we can be able to sell on a bigger market the partnership was described as historical a milestone and game changer but what are local businesses required to do to make the most of it it is up to each firm to produce high quality goods that customers want to buy. I think a lot of work has to be done on our side. That's what I was saying, like, it's private sector led on the Chinese side, but what is the private sector in Rwanda doing? The collective effort. So it would be nice to see more Rwandan uh, coffee traders or coffee businesses coming together to crowdfund uh, certain aspects to improve that capacity. Uh, and I think if we can tap into that, we can really, 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 really take advantage of this. The platform is there, uh, the opportunity is there, and it's up to us uh, to make this work. The capacity uh, is being built. There have been efforts that uh, are targeting training SMEs. More than 150 SMEs have been trained um, from the program that is being run by, um, by ITC and uh, RDB in partnership with ITC, RDB and Minicom. Uh, SMEs have been trained in being online, in doing business online. So really it's a, a timely opportunity. Uh, at the ICT chamber we'll be rolling out digital transformation clusters uh, that are going to reinforce further the uh, the digitization agenda and taking business uh, and Rwandan businesses online and building the capacities, not just uh, doing uh, selling or developing websites, but rather really taking them through the entire process uh, from uh, logistics to fulfillment to payments. As you very well know, we've got the Andela Institute, which has established its headquarters here. What Andela is actually doing is promoting the skills which are very much needed in this sector. Like they mentioned earlier here, there were already 13 students who've been trained in e-commerce and have been satisfied, certified. Yes, that's kind of a small number, but it's a good start. And given other partnerships like such strong hubs like Andela, I'm sure we're, sky, sky, the sky is the limit. Like Jack Ma said, for him it's been a dream that he's been waiting for for 10 years. Personally, as a software developer and a person who's invested heavily in tourism in Rwanda, this is a dream that I've also been having for the last decade. I hoped to have done this myself, but to see other more capable, stronger institutions, such as Alibaba and the government of Rwanda, partnering to make this a reality, this is way beyond what I had dreamt of in the first place. According to Edwin Sabuhoro, the platform is a big breakthrough for the country's tourism and trade. But the biggest challenge currently is getting the entire ecosystem on board. It's a great, great tool um, and, and it's a breakthrough for us and particularly for Rwanda and the continent in a way that we're able to access and tap into the global market. What we have been doing contemporarily is just to go there and look for these markets. But all over the world, the, 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 the markets have power to decide. So the consumer sits and looks at what they are looking for and decides. So what Alibaba and they are doing is helping us position Rwanda on the global consumer platform so that people all over the world can go in, look at the content, look at, uh, make decisions, and consume. For now, our biggest challenge is to get um, the, the total value chain on board, mm -hmm. so that when the, the, the consumer gets on board, it's not only tourism. Mm -hmm. You have coffee, mm -hmm. you have tea, mm -hmm. you have crafts, mm -hmm. you have other, these other SMEs, the products that once I consume, yeah. I shouldn't be able to get here in Rwanda to go to the parks and then think about the souvenir, no. I should be able to say, okay, I'm going to the volcanoes, and this is the tire of the souvenirs you want. So I can be able to shop before I even get here. Mm -hmm. I buy my coffee, I buy my tea, I buy my crafts, 
and they should be, that should be shipped mm -hmm. even before I arrive here. Mm -hmm. So that when I get here, I'm able to buy more mm -hmm. in relation with that, but I have already sold. During the signing for the EWTP, President Paul Kagame assured investors and business leaders that the country will continue to play its role to ease doing business. Government will continue to do its part to promote innovation by guaranteeing a conducive business and regulatory climate. In the latest World Bank doing business report, which uh, was released only today, Rwanda is now ranked as the 29th most business-friendly country in the world. <laughs> Up from 41st last year. From 41, we came down all the way to 29 in just one year. So things are happening and we should work even harder and smarter and move faster. Every time I talk to the president, we talk about technology, we talk about environment, we talk about jobs, we talk about technology. And every time I'm very impressed. And not only talk, he makes things happening. This EWTP with such a short time in Africa, it's amazing. So people also say, well, Rwanda, you don't, how can be an EWTP hub? You don't have a sophisticated internet, logistic, market, payment, and all the things are not ready. I said, this is why we came here. And I was living right there on this episode of Doing Business in Rwanda. Of course, we did find out how Rwandan businessmen are yet to leverage this new platform, the EWTP, and do business directly with a Chinese counterpart. If you have any feedback on this episode of Doing Business in Rwanda, be sure to send us an email to dbrr at abn360.com or tweet us at DBI Rwanda. From the entire Doing Business in Rwanda team, thank you very much for watching. My name is Michael Mjisha. Hello and welcome to Doing Business in Rwanda. My name is Michael Mjisha. On this particular episode, coffee is in focus. Now, you may want to know why. It's simple. Rwanda sold $66 million worth of coffee exports in 2017-2018 only. And the country is looking to embark on a strategy whereby one tree will be producing about three kilograms per season. Now, we took the road to speak to different stakeholders in the coffee industry and this is what we're talking about on this episode of Doing Business in Rwanda. Coffee industry in Rwanda is uh, very wide, and uh, to mention coffee sector, it has been among the so-called traditional export crops because it has been the country since long time ago. And they still play a major role in forex earning and also it plays really a big role in monetization of the rural economy. Elias Hachizamungu lives in Mutenderi sector in Goma district. Now that's more than 100 kilometers away from Kigali. He grows coffee on up to two hectares of land with close to 9,000 trees. I have 9,000 coffee trees, but I have a piece of land cleared and readied for more coffee. I want to have at least 15,000 trees by the end of the season. These trees do not work themselves, so I have hired people to work the plantation, cover the trees with grass, and when the coffee berries are ripe, there's some people pick them. Now, from last year's harvest, I have managed to buy myself a 3 million Toyota Corolla and send my children to school. I have medical insurance and live a better life off of my coffee farm. 
We are focusing much on the quality of coffee because uh, given the number that it is employs, it's because so far we, we, we are counting now around that uh, uh, 350,000 farmers countrywide with uh, almost uh, 200, uh, 250,000 tree spa farm. So it really plays a big role in the rural economy. And therefore, export is now the second one nowadays with 15% uh, contributing to the overall agricultural export. As Rwanda's coffee exports grow, the country seeks to embark on promotional strategies to raise the local consumption that currently stands at only 2%. It has been really a challenge because uh, you can imagine fa mobilizing farmers or any sector that doesn't have local consumption, it can't really develop. So that's why we really encourage as NAIB, we are now focusing on mobilizing people, teaching people, or bringing now the culture of drinking coffee. We think that when we will be able to consume a lot of coffee here in Rwanda, it can also contribute to the revenues because if we still rely on the international markets without even uh, knowing that we can consume what you are producing here is still a challenge. Local people can uh, consume. They were thinking that it's only for Western country. Uh, now I think uh, we have more educated people uh, and uh, coffee is contributing in the, our economy. I think uh, one of the challenge was how can we uh, promote our local, uh, what uh, the, the regulator is calling domestic consumption. I think this is key to help us uh, to promote uh, coffee. And that's why with this uh, coffee festival, we can engage and people can learn how to drink coffee and how benefit they can get from the coffee. The best way to promote our coffee is in each coffee shop and uh, it's worth to the Rwandans people try the, the coffee that they export uh, from everywhere in the world so it's, uh, it's fair that these professionals have the coffee in their coffee shop and give to the consumers, to the regular consumer who are uh, used to, to try different kind of coffee, different qualities. So it's better to have professionals to give uh, the, the real stuff for the, for the consumers. So as uh, coffee shops and baristas, we want to make sure that we're promoting quality in the coffee we're serving. So taking part in these trainings and these competitions allow us to, to show all the other baristas how they can be better and, and how we can serve the Rwandan coffee as best as we can. Elias coffee, just like any other farmer in Rwanda, ends up on wide load trucks to Kigali. In the capital, it is cleaned, roasted and packaged for export. Uh, when we started in 2009, we focused on producing what's called fully washed coffee. We started to invest in coffee washing stations, uh, investing in farmer agronomy uh, so that we could produce a higher quality product. Uh, when we started, we were quite small. Today, we export about 10.5 million pounds of fully washed coffee. Our pricing is not so much determined by what other countries and what the global price is doing, um, but we have to be able to produce that kind of quality in, in high volume. Yeah, Rwanda's reputation for coffee is growing uh, exponentially. Um, and, you know, there are many other coffee origins in the world that have built a reputation for quality. Um, they're also quite a bit more expensive. Um, so, you know, we'd like to, we'd like for Rwanda's coffee to demand a higher price on the global marketplace, but we have to kind of uh, play catch up to those that have been doing this for a long time. As a country, we can't produce such a huge volume, like even in our neighboring countries like Uganda, even compared to Kenya. Uh, but you can produce the highest quality and that's our competitive advantage and uh, that's where we focus. So looking at the effort that we put in place uh, through uh, the government of Rwanda and uh, together of course with uh, the private uh, operators in coffee, uh, since uh, 2000, uh, if you see 2001, at that time where we have only one coffee washing station, that means um, a station that can produce consistently high quality coffee and if you look at today we are at almost 300 and more uh, station coffee hosting station across the country. That means that uh, there is a lot of effort going on and uh, those partners 
had really realized after seven years that uh, after 2001 and coming to 2007 that uh, the effort that government was putting in place, the private sector together, to promote only high quality coffee was really recommendable. Rwanda is the only country in Africa that hosts the annual Cup of Excellency, a global premier coffee competition and auction. This prestigious competition evaluated thousands of coffees submitted for consideration, with winning coffees sold in global online auctions at premium prices. Many farmers, many coffee washing stations, every single year they are willing to take part into that. And they are now getting aware, they're getting, uh, uh, they get to understand that uh, it's one of the additional tools, a very special, important tool and the avenue to market their coffee. So if you compare to the last year, this is the only year that we've registered a high number of registered lots. This year, we registered 340 lots. When compared to last year, it was only 217 lots. And in addition to that, when we started the Cup of Excellence 2008, the passing score was 84. Now, every year night has moved to 84, 85, now we're 86. Now, you can imagine, we started with 84, we are now up to 86, I mean, and you're still getting more people, more coffees that are being uh, eligible for, for such a competition. It's, uh, it's, uh, that gives us uh, trust, that gives us confidence that uh, uh, there is a, a positive uh, uh, improvement when, uh, when you're talking about quality. There is a put, uh, an improvement in terms of people understanding how this can be a very useful tool. There is uh, this kind of enthusiasm among farmers that I won't take part into that and then they can be able to commit to, to make the right coffee. Participating in the Cup of Excellence helps me in marketing my coffee brand. Even uh, when you go to a personal level, whenever you tell your buyers that you are past Cup of Excellence, uh, there is a lot of excitement and there is a lot of expectation from us, which I think it's really important to do it. Deep down in the villages, approximately 100 plus kilometers away from Kigali. Now, we do meet uh, Mr. Ephraim Andenga Waganizi. He is one of the agricultural specialists here and he specializes in uh, coffee. It's very important to cut back the old trees at least from 7 to 10 years. See, when coffee trees in a plantation get too old, they no longer yield many berries and do not bring in much money. If you recall, I showed you a 10 acres plantation that I cut back. When the new stem rises, the coffee tree is young again and can bear a lot of berries. That is why this is a necessity for all coffee farmers. So in the past few years we've seen that the productivity has gone down, but uh, in most recent years we've tried now to renew and also to replant some new areas, but also to uh, feed the gaps of those aging trees. So we've uh, uh, helped farmers with uh, uh, technical assistance. As NIAB, we are assisting them by providing them some planting materials. As of now, we've uh, supplied more than five million uh, seedlings to support farmers with uh, pl planting new trees to, to mitigate that because it has really affected our productivity per tree. And that's where we leave it on this episode of Doing Business in Rwanda. We did look at some of the strategies that are being put in place to increase the local consumption, which currently stands at only 2%, and also to see how Rwanda's coffee can be of higher quality to be able to compete on global markets. That's where we leave it. If you have any feedback, be sure to send us an email to dbir at abn360.com or tweet us at DBI Rwanda. From the entire Doing Business in Rwanda team, thank you very much for watching. Hello and welcome to Doing Business in Rwanda. My name is Michael Mjisha. On this particular episode, we look at Rwanda, a country that hopes to make $800 million on the back of tourism. And of course, biggest to this conversation is 
conservation of the mountain gorilla. Now, we do know that uh, most of uh, these gorillas live in the Virunga vicinity, just right behind me. And uh, today we are at the 13th annual Kwitizina ceremony where 23 baby gorillas were named. Now, we went ahead to speak to different stakeholders to get the business sense and also to understand how far these conservation strategies have pushed the country. The conservation that's going on in Rwanda is is, is unique in the world. Most of the world's species are declining and here you have got the gorilla population I think up to I saw the last gorilla being born I think it was 600 number six. I witnessed it myself so I think what the world can learn is that there is a better way that you can turn you know the conservation projects into a huge financial opportunity. You can bring the tourists here. You've got new one and only hotels opening up here. You've got uh, people coming here. Uh, you, you know I think it's fantastic and the game park is another opportunity to come here so it's the future. Tourism is already the number one, right? Driver of the economy in Rwanda. So bring it on. Bring more, bring more tourists. Tell the world, come to Rwanda. Right? Rwanda's a great country. Conservation and environmental protection is at the heart of the Volkswagen Group. Uh, not just in Rwanda, but uh, in South Africa. We've been supporting the Wilderness Foundation for the past 20 years in the protection of Reno um, and, and other species. In Rwanda, if you, if you follow the Kwitizina um, uh, last year, our Africa MD was was one of the namers, uh, and this is in line with, uh, with with our presence here. We are a gold sponsor this year, sponsoring an event that is um, key for, for Rwanda and for the region. This uh, 13th edition is a testimony of the dedication and consistency of uh, our government when it comes to conservation and environmental protection. Uh, in Rwanda, the, the, the protection of the gorilla has not only been a, a plus for the environment, but also brought uh, much in terms of tourism, you know, in terms of uh, foreign income, and it has also changed the life of uh, the people living around uh, Musanze and Kinigi yeah. and beyond. This is a natural African reflex. So what is Rwanda, what Rwanda is doing, they are just bringing this old African reflex into life. And then we should uh, greet uh, Rwanda for this leadership to, as an example of African getting back to the roots. I'm happy that Rwanda is taking the lead on that, under the leadership of uh, President Kagame. This is something uh, we all Africa, we need to follow. Craig Jolie, along other conservationists, believe that conservation would have never been a success story in Rwanda if the country didn't focus on the combination of wildlife and the people. When one began focusing on conservation in Rwanda, it was all about wildlife, uh, but then it was realized that if in fact we were going to be successful in Rwanda, you had to really focus on a combination of wildlife and people. And uh, it's one of the things that I, I think AWF has done very, very well. You've got the example of Sabino Silverback Lodge, the first, the only community-owned lodge in Rwanda. Um, that basically has engaged about 7,500 families who live on the periphery of the park. Um, those families have benefited immensely over the course of the last 10 years uh, while Sabino Silverback has been operating. Um, over the course of the last 10 years, they've netted in excess of $3.2 million. And so I think that linkage between people and wildlife is very, very strong here in Rwanda. As a result, you have a lot of people who've been converted to conservation. And that's important. If in fact we don't have an African voice, an African constituency for wildlife, conservation is going to fail. Uh, Rwanda has engaged people. I think that's very, very important. And the same kind of models have to, have to be emulated elsewhere throughout Africa. Unless you engage local people, give them an opportunity to recognize that wildlife is one of their most important assets, you're likely not going to be successful. For me, this is one of the best projects in the world today, where you see nature and the community benefiting from each other. It's something spectacular. It's something that the whole of Africa can learn from. My life, my journey in tourism started with creating a game reserve in the Eastern Cape of South Africa 
from degraded drought strabies of used land. I assembled 20,000 hectares of land which had been totally devastated from wildlife. It employed 16 people. In our peak we employed 360 people without the multiplier effect of travel, of food, of transport and everything else that goes with us. So I've seen how both business and communities can work because we wouldn't have survived if we did not make a profit. So from all that I've just recently done a deal with the biggest uh, hotel group in the world, one of the biggest, called Accor. And we, in terms of that deal, decided that we're going to start a fund called the Community Conservation Fund Africa, because we believe that conservation and business will not exist without community involvement. The tourism is a critical part for the Rwandan economy. I think it's one of the most critical parts. So I think people like us who are investing in Rwanda and creating new destinations, uh, opening up the country to tourism from all over the world. One of the great things about an internationally recognized brand like One and Only is, is that we have guests and consumers all over the world who will learn about Rwanda through our brand. And so we're introducing new people and new communities to Rwanda. You know, I've been speaking at length as I travel around the Europe and the United States about the new developments that we have as a company. One and only is, is growing in Rwanda with two resorts. Rwanda is the thing that everybody's interested in. So we believe that for people to really enjoy Rwanda and not just simply come for one or two nights in uh, to see the gorillas, which of course is the most amazing thing that you can see, but th there's more to Rwanda than just the gorillas, right? So we wanted to open up to with our Nungwe Forest property, which is opening in oct on October the 1st, this ability to go and see a different part in the forest and the rainforest. So, I, you know, I think it'll be it, uh, a wonderful opportunity for us to have more than one center in Rwanda. Conservation goes far beyond just the gorillas to elephants and other wild animals. Speaking to Michael Onyeka, the Vice President of Conservation International Africa Field Division, stressed the note that there is a need for an urgent paradigm shift, and this can't be done by one organization. It's a lot of work with so many puzzles, missing puzzles, moving puzzles that we are all working to. And what I'm getting at is that it's not something that one sector alone can tackle. You need to address the issue of corruption, effective governance, uh, effective enforcement on the ground, which NGOs don't have. We don't have an army, we don't have the police, we don't run the Kenya Wildlife Service or the Rwandan Wildlife Service. It's the government side that does that. So, but the government needs to create an enabling policy environment with strong enforcement. And then the NGOs can bring our creative thinking, innovation, and funding to support it. The private sector needs to play a role because when you extract this ivory, it gets shipped. So who ships them? Either by air or by road or by sea. What is the role of logistics companies? So you see again, NGOs don't run logistic companies. So I wanted to highlight is that everyone makes the mistake of thinking when there is an issue like this, one organization should have dealt with it, but it's something that requires a collective effort from the state, private sector, and organized civil society. In May 2018, the government of Rwanda through the Rwanda Development Board and the Rwanda Convention Bureau signed a three-year sleeve partnership deal with Arsenal that's expected to add at least 300 million worth of new investments to the country and pushing close to the 800 million target in tourism revenue by 2024. At the Quitizina, we spoke to both the managing director of Arsenal FC and CEO of Rwanda Development Board for a look into the deal. For us, whenever we're looking for partners, we're looking for partners that we believe can help grow our profile, but also that we believe we can help them grow their profile. And the really exciting thing about the partnership for us was feeling like we could really help Rwanda grow one of their biggest exports and really drive tourism numbers uh, to this country. And we've already seen in the promotions and activations that we've done with Rwanda so far, the extraordinary reach that we can provide. 
So for example, a month or so ago, uh, we surprised our Arsenal first team by having some Rwandan dancers and drummers coming to the training ground and surprising the players after training. And then in just four days, we had 2.1 million people who'd seen that piece of content. So it was a really nice start to the partnership, showing how we can really drive the name of Rwanda and celebrate everything that Rwanda has to offer uh, through tourism, through this partnership. Today we have Alex Scott who's here to name one of the gorillas. Over 100 caps for England, over 100 caps for Arsenal, pl played in the Olympics. We've got Lauren here as well to name a gorilla, part of the Invincible team, two league titles. So we've got Arsenal legends coming out here um, to help promote Rwanda. We'll have Arsenal first team players out here. We'll have Arsenal coaches coming here to coach boys, girls, men, women, coaches as well. We'll also have some of the best Rwandan players coming back to London to train at our facilities. So it's a really multifaceted partnership. It's, it's branding, it's promotion with players, it's bringing Arsenal here, it's bringing Rwandans back to London as well. 2024, $800 million is what we want to achieve in tourism. And that means doubling from $438 million that we achieved in 2017. Now, that requires a lot of work and a lot of efforts to do that. But we're going to focus on doing mainly three things. Number one, we're going to make sure that there's more and uh, better infrastructure in Rwanda so that when tourists come, they have good hotels, they have uh, good airlines flying into Rwanda, they have high-speed internet, they have uh, all the infrastructure that connects them around the country. Already, we do well in those areas. We have lots of five-star hotels, but there's a lot that we can still do, especially outside Kigali. So we're going to be focusing on that a lot. Number two, we're going to market Rwanda even more uh, to the world. We just signed a deal between Rwanda and Arsenal where we had a lot of attention and a lot of recognition of our brand in the tourism world. Because of that, we've seen a very increased interest in our country. And so marketing Rwanda, not just with Arsenal, but we're marketing Rwanda in the US. We did a documentary called Rwanda the Royal Tour in the US. We're signing a deal with Alibaba to have our tourism uh, products available on the Chinese e-commerce. All these are going to be the different ways that Rwanda is going to be known um, and we're marketing Rwanda to the rest of the world. The third part of our strategy is service delivery. And that is everything to do with service delivery, from ensuring this peace and security which we already have in the country, but also really when uh, our guests go to the hotels, really ensuring that their services improve, they get better uh, all the time. And the quality is really uh, a very, very, very good standard. And other than that, we're also doing conservation even more because our tourism is very much anchored on conservation. So making sure that that we don't lose focus of is very important in our strategy. And we believe by doing all these three things, we will be able to achieve the target that we want. We are just getting on that now. And that's where we leave it on this episode of Doing Business in Rwanda. We did take a close look at $438 million that was generated as revenue in 2017 only on the back of tourism and also a 7% indirect contribution to the national GDP. Now, we also looked at conservation and how this is actually helping the local households live a better life, but also enlarging the habitat for the gorillas and also other animals in Rwanda. Allow us to leave it right here for this episode of Doing Business in Rwanda. Now, if you have any feedback, be sure to send us an email to dbir at abn360.com or tweet us at DBI Rwanda. My name is Michael Mjisha and from the entire team, thank you very much for joining us. Hello and welcome to Doing Business in Rwanda. My name is Michael Mjisha. Now, coming up on this show, we're definitely looking at how 3,000 youth and delegates have convinced Ninkigali to discuss matters continental transformation. Now, of course, this platform that dates back six years ago, opened by the president of Rwanda, His Excellency Paul Kagame, seeks to create and bring together opportunities for African youth from different walks of lives and of course meeting with investors and venture capitalists and more learning uh, this platform. Of course we do delve into these matters and bring you this particular conversation on this episode of Doing Business in Rwanda.
the discussion all about with the young people is about transforming Africa. Mm. As we've been discussing, uh, we want to see the young people, even themselves already, we can see the commitment from them, that the development of Africa will not wait for anyone else but them. This means, this means more ownership than ever before. And this is the right time for them to act, especially when our leadership from the African Union, recently in Kigali, they signed the Continental Free Trade Area. And the reason of the topic, even the theme of discussion, is to see how the young people take advantage of the, the Continental Free Trade Area, all this regulation that they are putting in place, all these laws that are enabling uh, countries from, to increase more intra-trade within African countries, to make it easy to trade and cross border and do business with each other. And looking beyond the, the boundaries that were created during colonial time that would be remaining, that could remain as a geographical uh, boundaries, but you want really something that is going to be seamless and smooth transaction between the young people in one country in another country. Mm -hmm. So the discussion mostly is about how do we tap into opportunities that we have as a continent by the young people. Oh. A curator, an artist, artist an true. innovator, and together we can we transform, can transform Africa. Africa. I said we can transform our Africa. Our For six years, Youth Connect Africa has created a platform for young Africans to pitch innovative ideas that provide solutions for impeding challenges on the continent. For some, it's the first time they stand in front of an audience to speak about their businesses. I was a little bit getting nervous, but uh, at the end of the day, I think uh, the, yeah, it went well. Uh, we pitched, we managed to get our message out there. And uh, yeah, the, the feedback was promising. Our company is called Bag Innovation. We are a youth consultancy agency where we train university students to become consultants. We're trying to basically solve the problem of unemployment in Rwanda by making the young people from university and fresh graduates more ready for the job markets and as well as more employable. Where we equip them with the skills and all, all these trainings we offer them for free to be able to leverage from the talents from the, uh, the young people have to offer better services to companies. I think these kind of platforms are not accessible to all the youth, so which is something that we need to uh, really look into because I, I, I know that a lot of people have different solutions that are out there on the market, but they didn't get to know about this kind of event. And uh, so I think it's definitely something that we need to look into. During the 2018 Youth Connect Africa, Kemdilim Waje, CEO of Future Software, urged the youth to look at the SDGs as job opportunities, stressing the note that each and every one of them is a problem that seeks a solution. Each SDG is basically a problem statement, right? And there are multiple problems under that particular problem statement, right? So you talk about women empowerment. There are lots and lots of problems that women in Africa are facing um, that technology can solve, that youth can solve through creating businesses or creating programs um, for women, for example. So how can you basically just take an SDG, look for a problem within that SDG, find a solution and build a business. And I think the biggest um, problem that we're solving and also the reason why we started um, the company is to put African businesses on the map. Mm. Um, I studied in Germany and in 2005 I moved back to Nigeria and you know, I would Google Italian restaurant in Lagos, zero results found. I'm like, how am I supposed to find anything or do anything here, you know? Then you have to call your friends and they will call somebody else who might know somebody and then somebody's uncle's mother's cousin will <laughs> now finally tell you, okay, you can go to this address. And you get there and it's closed because you didn't know they didn't open on Monday, right? Um, so for me, it was very important to actually um, start you know, pushing for African businesses to be on the map um, because how else can you trade with the rest of the world and the rest of Africa? As Africa's youth population is forecasted to reach 2.5 billion people by 2050, the continent needs to create inclusive programs to have more youth involved in policy making, as Rwanda's Minister for Youth goes on to explain. We are looking for more uh, about three things. Mm -hmm. Uh, more policy orientation. The discussion, the conversation going on, it should influence our policies as ministers and ministries that we lead. The countries where you're coming from, we have done an analysis and we found some of the youth policies are as old as 10 years old. 
10 years, it cannot influence or change anything. Instead, the youth are, are moving faster and quicker than the policy itself. Sure. Secondly is programs. Mm -hmm. We should do programs tailored to the needs of the youth with the discussion of young people. So this should influence the programs in the respective countries, how they program and make things happen using the experience of young people and involving young people to plan for young people. Oh. The third is partnership. Why we saw everybody here, we have the development partners, we have ministries and governments, we have the civil society, we have the private sector that creates jobs, we have the media that makes publicity and makes it happen, we have also the young people. So we have the right people on the table. How do you create partnership? How do you leverage in everyone's areas of expertise? How do we work together? How do we have one common vision and direction for the development of Africa? So program, partnership, and policy influence. Now, between 2000 and 2018, Rwanda enjoyed a GDP growth of between 6 and 8 percentage points. Hello, and welcome to Doing Business in Rwanda. My name is Michael Mujisha. On this particular episode, we look at the country's economic development 24 years after the 1994 genocide perpetrated against the Tutsi. And on this particular episode, we look into the youth to see how much they contributed, but also how much they are contributing to this rather nascent economy. This is Doing Business in Rwanda. The magnitude of the 1994 genocide perpetrated against the Tutsi was largely attributed to high participation of the youth. Their role in Rwanda's post-genocide transformation is also very critical. So one of the things that we are really passionate about doing is uh, recollecting stories. So um, we are training uh, authors, we train authors, we create a vibe around literacy because we believe that the more literate we are, the less prone to conflict we will be. And we teach young people to be self-reliant. So I'm very hopeful. Um, Rwanda has you look around you, every day there's new roads, there's so many things that the government is doing, but I also love the sense of responsibility. Young people are starting businesses, they're getting out, they're taking risks to build the country, and every day you hear a new person say, this is my contribution to Rwanda. It starts with self, it starts with actually believing in yourself, believing in your contribution for your country, understanding that in 1994 you may not have been born or, um, you know, or we're still too young to participate in the liberation of the country. But now you can you know, participate in the development of your country in your specific way, whether you're an artist, whether you're, um, uh, you know, you're doing business, whether you're in an other, any other field. It's what you can bring to the table uh, that will actually elevate your country. Now there's a foundation of a new country and there's an opportunity to show a different side of Rwanda. There's a lot more going on, there's a lot more happening, uh, whether it being music, paintings, uh, there are many different ways. And uh, one of the ways I would encourage, especially the youth, would be through photography. Uh, a lot of the images that were shown before were very dark and graphic, but now it's important to show a country that's rebuilding and a country that has a very bright future. The youth is um, the, the energy and the force behind, behind any kind of um, society. And I believe that the, the young people here in my country of Rwanda um, are, the, are the future of the country. They are the ones who have the energy and they are the ones who are fresh with uh, fresh ideas um, to, um, to build the country and also yeah, and also like really support support our people in whether economically or or socially and most importantly in my field which is the arts the arts field um, we have we, we we have a platform where um, we, we we are being able to to talk and reach out to to people, whether in our country or, or even outside our country. So I think 
we, we are the voice of our country and our people. Now, over thousands of youth are walking in Kigali on the 10th annual Walk to Remember event, an event that was set up as an aim to instill the idea of fighting a genocide ideology among the youth, but also to instill the idea of working together to build a nation. The programs that the government of Rwanda has is to provide an environment that would nurture the youth. We don't want to think for them. We want to provide them a platform where they can think what is good for them and what is good for their country. Uh, Walk to Remember was started by youth and it is an initiative that is supported by the entire government. That's the same program that we always do. Whenever they come up with a good initiative, we always provide them all the support that they need to move forward. This is an encouragement to others as well that have not done anything yet. But beyond this also, we see the youth in this period of commemoration. We see them going in the rural areas, uh, supporting vulnerable people, becoming the children of the parents that lost or uh, had no children at all. So they, the Rwandan youth is a youth is a child of every Rwandan. They feel it's the values that we are nurturing into them to feel that they are the Rwandan future, but they also have the responsibility to take care of the elders that are not capable or are not ca are strong enough right now to carry the mantle. And uh, we see them even this whole period of remembering, they are going to do a lot of activities. The whole of April, the whole of May, it's going to be specifically remembering the fellow youth that perished. But what they are going to do is to do more vo uh, vocational work like um, voluntary work, uh, community work, construction of uh, houses of vulnerable people, uh, constructing uh, in Umudugudu, wherever they are located in the communities, doing much more work and be visible, participating in the discussions, uh, sharing experiences wherever they are on social media, using the platform that they have to see, we want to see them really participating in this and we have seen it in the past and we have seen it even starting right now. It's really over the years a realization that the youth has a role to play and they are, they are really the biggest force for the, the, the country, for the economy, for social transformation and so on and so forth. They are big in, in numbers uh, and what we see today is really them uh, taking uh, that challenge on uh, and an example is this work to remember that is actually a thought and a concept by the youth really to mobilize and uh, to demonstrate that they are ready to contribute. So I see them really continuing to play a big role uh, and also becoming more and more aware. Uh, there is a lot to contribute through really um, even mobilization and sensitization through social media, but also actively and directly by taking positions in the leadership um, uh, institutions uh, across government, across uh, local government, across private sector, across social, uh, civil society. Really, they, they, and the call, when you remember, or from our president has been, now even venture, even think that really you the next um, to really take on the, 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 the button and continue the, the journey. So I see the youth playing um, a big role. Yeah. We, I mean, like the youth doesn't mean that you're younger, you cannot do anything. So I also work like in many different areas, like in private sectors, industries, because we believe that we're the young people, but we also have the power and the ability to do these things. And we're also the next generation that we can do the rest of the things. Rwanda is a very good example in Africa. I saw the government what they are doing is a part of education, the part of training, and part of uh, giving job to the to the young. If you have the more than 50 percent of the population are young, so we have to do a lot for 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 these young in order to to be more than to involved in the development of our countries. Everywhere you go in Senegal or New Rwanda, it's a duty of the government to work hardly in order to educate them, to train them, in order to give them jobs and to have their participation in a high level in the development of the country. For me, it's a very great honor to be here today, coming from Senegal, I'm the Minister of the Culture. 
and to participate to the ceremonies which is celebrating what happened in 1994. For every African people, you have to know what happened here and to celebrate with the people of Rwanda. It's a great honor for me to be here and to be allowed by the President Maxal to be here with you to celebrate what happened here today. Almost two and a half decades ago, Rwanda suffered the loss of hundreds of thousands of lives and her economy was left in total devastation by the 1994 genocide perpetrated against the Tutsi. 24 years down the road, the country saw a miraculous economic turnaround fostered by good governance and today registers as one of the fastest growing economies in Africa. More than one million people perished, but also the economy also suffered. Uh, the economy had lost quite a bit. Actually, half of its um, potential was lost. So the quick recovery, actually, uh, we attribute it to a visionary leadership that really uh, has set uh, it as a deliberate um, commitment right from the liberation struggle to the government of unity and many institutions that have been set uh, in place to really make sure Rwandans reunite, um, uh, reconcile, and focus on productive uh, work, um, patriotism, and so on and so forth. So leadership really, for me, holds um, a key to what we see today. But also, uh, the Rwandans really have been, uh, I would say, really they, 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 they have listened to, to that message and worked together. Really, when you see efforts in reconciliation, when you see how people now can live together, uh, when you see how people really have taken even steps to seek for forgiveness and to grant for, um, their pardon, those are really amazing things that we don't, we don't take for granted. So, um, on the one side, really leadership, strong institutions, but also Rwandans that really have accepted the message of really coming back to what we were before. One people, one nation, all committed to really to making Rwanda uh, a success. Over the world, there are things that is not genocide. Here in Africa, we think and we are very convicted that what happened here is very gen a very deep genocide against Tutsi. Rwanda has taken a, a, a long way, a journey of development. We believe we've been there because of the support of other partners that we had along the journey. So we say never again. It's our responsibility today to really seriously recheck what we are saying what we are doing, the systems we are putting in place so that really never again becomes never again. And that's where we leave it on this episode of Doing Business in Rwanda from the second best place to do business on the continent, but also one of the fastest growing economies. Now we did look back 24 years ago as the 1994 genocide perpetrated against the Tutsi happened, much of it on the back of the youth. And we fast forwarded to today as the youth are now having so much contribution to the growth of the economy. This is where we leave it. If you have any feedback, be sure to send us an email to dbir at abn360.com or tweet us at DBI Rwanda. My name is Michael Mujisha and from the entire Doing Business in Rwanda team, thank you very much for watching.